All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, anybody, everybody and anybody who's watching this. Uh, today's video, I'm going to be going over monetary and economic growth, uh, mainly going through just a few small clarification points. This is mostly building on knowledge that we've already covered. This is not necessarily new material, but there is one part that is fairly new, and it's the quantity theory of money in the equation of exchange. That is a fairly substantially different thing, but when we talk about economic growth, we've kind of already mentioned this, at least you should have been able to put two and two together with a lot of the economic growth material. Uh, this will be the last video for unit five for my class. Uh, for those of you that are watching that are not from my district, a lot of the information here is pulled from the same places that College Board polls are from, so if this looks similar to what the uh, AP Classroom videos are, it's, yeah, we're, we're pulled from the same material on that. Uh, this is just my version of it, so I think too crazy, just my explanations in my video with it. So, let's go into it. So monetary and economic growth. So first things first, let's talk about monetary growth, namely changes in the money supply and how that affects inflation. Because uh, the very common thing is that, that we say in like the real world is that when you print more money, it makes prices go up. And there is a, like a basic explanation for that, which is that the more money exists, the less valuable it becomes. So it becomes less valuable and prices will rise in response to that. Because if money is worth less, I'm gonna charge more try and recoup the same amount of value as I would before as a business owner. So as I just refer baseline concept here, inflation can occur when the money supply either increases or decreases too fast for a sustained period of time. If it's gradual, if it's a slow burn, it's generally fine. It's why our uh, government tends to, I mean, our government prints money. They just don't print insane amounts in short bursts. They print small amounts over longer stretches of time effectively think of it as trying to match the population increases with with the amount of money in circulation. So to sort of describe how this works in an example with regards to things we've covered in the class, let's say we're doing an expansionary monetary policy while we're at full employment. So we're at full employment and here's, there's, this is the full graph. Let's imagine we're at AD1 and SRAS1. So we're at full employment and we decide to do an expansionary policy, monetary namely. So a monetary policy is going to do some things that we want to be aware of. It's going to increase the money supply. So in doing so, spending will start to rise. As the money supply starts to grow, banks can lend out more, people can borrow and spend more. And as they do so, aggregate demand begins to climb. That's that blue line getting us up to here, which gives us higher prices and higher output. Um, we're past full employment. Effectively, we move into an inflationary gap. Now, that already matches our idea here, but we want to make sure we get the complete picture, which is the long run part too. So in the long run, as those prices start to rise, as price level picks up, prices and wages are going to need to rise accordingly. If you see prices go up, then it's not just gonna be the price of goods, it's gonna be the price of resources too. And if resources become more expensive, and if wages need to go up because everything's getting more expensive, so you should pay your workers more, that's gonna make it harder for businesses to do things. So SRAS decreases to get back to equilibrium. This is the long run self-adjustment from unit three that we've covered before, where we moved increased aggregate demand, and then because prices and wages can change in the long run, we get back to full employment. But this is me sort of flipping it on its head and saying, okay, but let's talk about what the heck just happened. The Federal Reserve, the government, just did an expansionary monetary policy. And all that ended up coming from it at the end of the day is what? We started here, we ended here. What good came of the policy? I mean, prices went up, but did output change at all? Did our GDP actually go up? No, not not in the long run. In the small window, sure, we had a little bit more production, but in the long run, all we get is higher prices. That is kind of important. Because in those long run changes, we have an overall increase in price level, but my output decreased. It went back to its original amount. So we scaled back our productivity. This is a very key idea. It means that there is no real sustainable change, no long-term change to real output as a change as a result of the change in the money supply. So just by putting more money out into the economy doesn't magically make the economy grow. Is the idea. It doesn't make us produce more. It actually just makes our prices go up. 
at the end of the day. It might trick you into believing we're producing more because we do produce more for a window of time. But eventually, the fact that a lot of things in the economy sort of counter cyclically to what is going on, it'll undo itself. So output is independent of changes in the money supply. It's a key idea because it means that the Federal Reserve can't just make our economy grow. They can try and help fix problems, like if we're in a recession or an inflationary period, an expansion or contractionary monetary policy might help us get back. But if we were at full employment and we're like, we're doing well, but we want our great to be better, if we wanted to improve our productivity long term, the Federal Reserve can't really do that directly. There is a way they can do it indirectly. Now, this idea is going to get us to a kind of interesting logical question. And it's called the quantity theory of money. The basic idea is that since all the money in circulation is being spent on all the goods and services, therefore the total money in circulation, the total amount of money in circulation is equal to the total value of all goods and services sold. Effectively, the total amount of money circulating in our economy should equal our nominal GDP. That we have enough money in our economy to purchase and buy every single good and service within our economy. If you didn't have the right amount of money, then you would have services and goods not worth paying for, if that makes sense. Now, this actually gets us a formula. It's called the equation of exchange. This is not a formula where the math part matters a lot. This is a formula where the theory matters a lot more. So this, this formula is M times V equals P times Y. That's four variables. Any of you who like algebra are excited. Every other rational human being hates this, but it's not a math problem really. So the idea is if you take the money supply and multiply it by the velocity of money, which you're like, wait, what the, it's how many times a dollar is spent in a year. The velocity of money is how quickly we spend our money. That's the idea. It's not how quickly you can throw a penny at your buddy. It's not that. It's specifically how fast it gets spent. It'll equal the price level times your total output or real GDP. If you take price level times real GDP, you actually get nominal GDP. So what they're saying is if you take the amount of money in circulation, which is the amount of money that exists times how frequently it's used, because if it's there, that's one thing. But if we spend $3 trillion five times in a year, then we actually spend $15 trillion, right? <laughs> which is why you get this formula, because it's like, well, we spend $15 trillion, GDP measures our spending. Oh. As a heads up, the velocity money is pretty stable. It doesn't change very often. We, our spending frequency is fairly stable. It doesn't change a lot. And output is also pretty stable. If we go back to that previous slide with the graph, in the long run, we kept going back to the same level of output. You always gravitate towards that full employment level of output. So it's also not going to change very much. Now it can, um, if your productive capabilities, your resources get better, if you get better at producing things, period, then your long-term production should improve. But just changing the money supply isn't going to cut it. So here's kind of an example of how that works. And I pulled this one directly from the uh, College Board video because it's a good example. So this idea matters because changing the money supply only really changes the inflation rate, and I'll show you how. Let's say the central bank or the Federal Reserve increases the money supply by 2%. That through monetary policy, whether that's lowering the reserve requirement or lowering the, or lowering the discount rate or in buying bonds, any of those things ends up increasing the money supply by about 2%. I look at that formula. I'm going to think a couple of things. So they're increasing M by 2%, so like plus 2% there, right? mentioned that the velocity of money is pretty stable. So that's probably not gonna change. So there's a 2% gain to this side of the equation. There's probably gonna need to be a two, there's gonna need to be a 2% change on this side of the equation. Now, is it a 2% gain in prices or in output? Well, we already mentioned that in the long run, output doesn't really change because of the money supply. It sort of stays the same. So if I'm thinking about this formula, what I'm thinking is, V and Y are kind of fixed variables. That V and Y don't really change very much. So if M goes up by 2%, then logically speaking, P on this side would be the one that also goes up 2%. So if that velocity of money is stable 
and our output is also stable, and if you're at full employment, it's pretty stable, increasing the money supply, increasing M, will only really cause inflation. Basically, this is just a mathematical formula that proves the graph thing we did three slides ago. That when you increase the money supply, you don't actually get long-term growth out of that necessarily. You just get higher prices. That when you increase M, you're only really going to increase P in this formula because V and Y are fixed. Now, for people who are worried about math in the AP exam, generally speaking, they won't ask you to do very much math here. They may ask something like I just asked, which is, hey, if M goes up by 2% in this formula and this economy is at full employment, what is logically happening on the right side? And you would say, well, P is probably going up by 2%. That is kind of math. Not, I don't treat that as like, you know, you have to do two times five to equal 10 or anything. That is much more just the logic of the formula that you have to understand. But the amount of money in circulation should equal price times output. So total GDP, real nominal GDP. So the total money spent in our economy should equal GDP, which tracks based on the definition of GDP is it's overall spending. This is just all the money in circulation times however often it's being spent equals total spending levels in the economy. I mean, that makes sense to me, but this, but logically why it's important is that it means that really increasing money supply only changes prices because the velocity of money and output aren't really changing. Cool. That's just one thing off there. Now that's all monetary growth. Let's talk about actual economic growth. So they mentioned that output doesn't really change there in the long term, but if I'm thinking real world America, our production has changed over long periods of time, right? Like we make more stuff now in 2020 than we did back in 2010, than we did back in 2000, than we did back in 1990. If my output was never actually changing, then that wouldn't be happening. Our economy is growing, so how the heck is that happening? All right. So first things first, a uh, hold. Don't get mad at me. A new graph, but not one that you ever have to really worry about drawing. The aggregate production function. So productivity and our output is mostly, if not always, tied to how much capital we've got as well as how much technology we've got. That is sort of the underlying key principle of economic growth, is that economic growth is driven by capital and technology. That the better resources you have for producing things allows you to produce more things on average per person. Not just more things total, because you have more people, so you should be producing more things total but that you're producing more per person. That's where our growth has been coming from, is that we've had better tech, we've had smarter workers with new ideas, you know, your Bill Gates, that, that kind of thing. If you wanted to make the comment about Elon Musk with SpaceX, I mean, yeah, that might actually further space travel stuff, so sure, go for it. And improvements in technology as well. So like human capital, physical capital, technology, all of those things. The aggregate production function, which is a graph I would draw at least once in your journal, with output as your y-axis, that's interesting, and capital. You can see physical capital here, you can see total capital here, you can see capital per worker written here. I see all of it. This is just the first picture I found online that I actually saw and could actually really use in this PowerPoint. Um, I would probably use total capital or capital per worker, because it's not just physical capital. And you have this curve that looks kind of weird to be honest you're like okay so it goes up a lot really quickly because this is all like you have the x number of workers so they can produce whatever they can produce with just a bare minimum of technology as you add more technology they can produce more but there's a diminishing return aspect to it because if i have a hundred people making something technology can get amazing but at the end of the day i still have a hundred people making stuff so i'm going to have diminishing returns at a certain point this is not new logically. The idea is capital helps us produce things. That isn't crazy. You should be aware of that. Now, in terms of the graph, the only thing you need to be able to do visually with this graph, other than like, I get that this means it's going up, is that if technology improves, I move my entire line up. If I've got better tech, then I've got across the board, better physical capital per person at every single step along the way. Sick, I'm going to take my whole line and move it straight up to match with that. You're basically I'm increasing the function. If you want a thing that says like my production possibilities curve and I'm just shifting it outward, kind of like that. It's total productivity. It's along the same lines as that idea. 
when you have technology improved, your aggregate function function grows. As a disclaimer for any of you that are wondering, uh, this is the thing that was like added to College Board's um, CED, uh, which is our course educate our CE, yeah, so, so course educational guide. It's basically telling us what we're supposed to teach each course. This was added two years ago in like one tiny, teeny, tiny bullet that has led us to believe as teachers that they are not going to ask you to draw this on an FRQ because it is literally like hidden in one little tab under one little section and we hadn't seen it before. Um, this is probably along the lines of things like the business cycle uh, and the circular flow model, which are concepts you do need to know, but are not things they ever ask you to draw. They might ask you about this saying like, hey, in the aggregate production, the aggregate production function tells us what about the relationship between capital and output. And the relationship is productivity is tied to capital. So the more capital we have, the more we can produce, which is something that most of you could probably have figured out without a graph. But they still want them to have this extra, just little visual component to throw in there. So in terms of draw, draw this in your journal once and draw that little shift up of technology one time so you know that it can move. This is not like one of the six key graphs that the FRQ section on this AP exam is built around. This is just an extra visual to give you a look at a thing that you already hopefully understand. Now, economic growth. That's sort of a visual of economic growth as well. So economic growth is defined as an increase in real GDP per capita over time. It means that your average productivity per person is going up over time. So like long run is mattering, right? So if we're producing more per person over time, then we're experiencing growth. That's just the lay and simple of it. In this class, we actually have seen visuals of this. This is a thing we can show you. Uh, I'm gonna move my head out of the way. Move this up over there. If I were to take my aggregate demand and aggregate supply model and shift, namely the long run aggregate supply grow over to the right, because that would then cause everything else to sort of follow along suit as the long run self adjustment happens. So if I shifted LRAS to the right, then SRAS would shift to catch up and long run stuff like that. So if I take my entire model and namely the LRAS over to the right, then now my full employment is at a higher number. Full employment was 500 billion here. Now it's 700 billion here. My economy has actually grown now because when I move off of this line, I'm just going to move back to it, but I'm moving back to this and not to that. I'm moving back to 700, not to five. So it's more of a permanent change in my GDP. It's also shown by an outward shift of the production possibilities curve. This is the same as this, which is weird for students to realize. It's like, wait a minute, I'm producing more at all levels. It's like, yeah, remember back in unit one, like way, 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 way back, like four months ago, that when you had like this little PPC graph and it's like, cool, we're better at producing things. It's like, yeah, we can produce more, Mr. McRitchie. Yeah, and there's now a new line and now we're further out, yay. This and that are the same thing, which is going to cause nightmares because that was easy and that is not as easy <laughs> to visualize. So economic growth is what really allows for permanent changes in our economy. This is permanent. That's the big thing. It is setting a new playing field. You have created a new economic system that you're in. Well, not system. So economic system is the wrong word for it. A new sort of economic uh, starting point. For you to become in your full employment is now at a new level so all of your sort of gravity of your economy will be reoriented around this new point and it's further ahead so it's actually better okay now our economy is really in a better spot as opposed to these little like temporary like i'm increasing ad but an aggregate supply is just going to shift back so who really cares it's like no this is who really cares this is cool if i moved lras over then yeah now we're into the permanent mode of our economy is now permanently going to improve. If you're worried about LRAS moving to the right, and like, wouldn't that then be like a recessionary gap, Mr. McRitchie? It's important to mention that just about anything that would cause LRAS to shift to the right would also cause SRAS to shift to the right. So realistically, whenever you're seeing like an LRAS like shift over, imagine that effectively the entire X is moving because LRAS will shift over and SRAS will shift over with it and I'll have a new equilibrium at that new spot. So with economic growth, important question to ask is like, okay, well, how do you get it then? Productivity is the big thing. Productivity is what we are talking about here. 
Okay, what makes us more productive though? Because that's like great, but what the hell does that mean? Uh, big example, vocab word. I mentioned this back when we talked about aggregate demand and aggregate supply with the long run curve. A thing that moves it is capital stock. Uh, capital stock is the total accumulation of all capital within your economy. Uh, additionally, increased usage of new and better technology would also do it. So if you've got better tech, if you've got capital stock improvements, boom, that'll do it. Fun disclaimer, though. This is an important thing to mention. Investment spending is spending by businesses on capital, which means that when investment spending is happening for sustained periods of time, not just for like a quick little like, oh, they bought a new computer. When they're increasing capital sp uh, increasing this investment spending over long periods of time so they don't so they have not just more tech but also more workers to use that tech that improves capital stock and would also improve productivity now that gets us to a kind of the big question which is all right if investment spending drives this up then wouldn't things like interest rates matter here Right, because interest rates and investment have an inverse relationship. So when we talked about our money market graph and how like monetary policy affected interest rates or crowding out and how that affects interest rates on a normal funds market graph, does that affect our long-term growth? And the answer is yes, if it's sustainable. If those changes are holding that interest rate in a particular spot, if you've increased the money supply to a level that allows for interest rates to stay low for a while, which will encourage a lot of investment spending and allow for the population to grow as a result of it. In the long run, an increase in investment spending would cause an increase in LRAS. So if you're seeing an FRQ problem that asks something like, okay, um, there's been an expansionary monetary policy, it's lowering interest rates, what is the long-term impact on that, on the long run aggregate supply curve? You would probably say, or at least I would say, That'll actually improve the long run aggregate supply curve over time because of the improvements in capital stock will allow for economic growth, allowing for full employment to now be at a higher level or full employment output or natural rate of output to be at a higher overall level. Now, that all being said, monetary policy is done by the Federal Reserve. Can the actual government, like Congress and the president, help this happen because we mentioned fiscal policy as government spending and taxes but like we don't really get into a lot what are we spending on and what we spend on will actually matter here because the government can help create long-term economic growth that's part of their fiscal policy stuff is they want to encourage long-term growth because these temporary things are temporary and that's not what we want so they have really three things to sort of target if they target these three things with policies there's a good chance they'll be able to cause economic growth those three things are kind of the things that should make sense based off what we talked about so far. They should be targeting human capital and namely like an average level of human capital per worker. And the human capital are your workers knowledge and skills. So we're talking about like education, stuff like that. They should target technology. Yes, because overall technology being better will allow you to produce more across the board per person, generally speaking. So yeah, technology and then physical capital, which usually in technology is a part of this, but they mean this from like a infrastructure standpoint. Capital is anything that helps us produce stuff. So like not just technology, but like new buildings and infrastructure like roads and utilities and stuff like that. Things that the government manages that can help make a business's life a little bit easier. So I've got a little like table with some examples that can help us out. So when we're talking about human capital per worker, some policies they could actually be doing would be specifically, and this is important to mention that it should be specifically talked about, is government spending on things like education and job training. So if they're spending more funneling towards education that allows for like Head Start or the GI Bill, which allows for more college education or better public school, great, then those things will allow for higher levels of human capital per worker because smarter, more creative workers can find new ideas and new plans on how to make things more productive across the board. Think like Ford and the automobile industry and how mechanization, his ideas for interchangeable parts and stuff allowed for much more production. Talking tax credits as well. So think, remember, fiscal policy is government spending and taxes, so it's good to think of both. You could also do things like tax credits for education. Like I can tell you that when you're in college, there are things in your taxes that you can deduct for spending on like college. So if I 
spend five hundred dollars out of pocket on textbooks i could write that off in my taxes that is meant to encourage you to go to school to make it a little more financially motivated to go to school ditto for things like job training where a lot of programs that are job training is a tax write-off great that is very helpful so it's again it's encouraging you to better yourself it's they like it's cool that you graduated high school or whatever but we want to have you continue to get educated past that point because experience is very helpful but there's also things from like books and other people that listening to will help you be a better worker and that'll allow you to produce more technology this is kind of straightforward government spending on literally technology itself but usually in the form of things like research grants where they give scientists lots of money to help produce things the covid vaccine is a good example of that where um while technically the companies that made the covid vaccine weren't ones that were a part of this program um President Trump uh, had a program where he was helping reinvest money into uh, pharmaceutical companies to try and find a vaccine for COVID. And that kind of money is, pro even if it doesn't get the COVID vaccine from those companies, would probably help those companies reinvest in better technology, have better equipment going forward, because that spending already happened. Say they bought a bunch of good machines to help them find this COVID vaccine. They don't find the COVID vaccine, but they can use that to find cures for other diseases Hell yeah, that's a good win. And tax credits for research and development, things like green energy, carbon emissions, SpaceX I mentioned was that is actually a decent example of this because the government has helped SpaceX get off the ground running. Things like tax credits and all that. Renewable energy pushing towards green energy. A lot of the science that goes towards green energy is helpful for other fields. Solar panels are useful for space travel, etc. Things like that. And then physical capital per worker, infrastructure. When the government's helping build new, better roads, because that helps people get people to work faster. Uh, if they build a better electric grid, or if they make internet more accessible to people, uh, that's technically a private thing, but the government has some regulation level when it comes to the internet. Waterways, things like that, uh, where it's mostly government spending, but also you can do tax credits for businesses to like ch chip in and help there. Um, when the business provides for things like... Uh, carpooling carpooling plans and stuff like that which helps get people to work faster and also takes up less roadways which helps other people get to work faster there's a bunch of really like specific things the government is doing so these are some ideas on like general specifics of like if they're spending on education which is more specific than just government spending it would help improve human capital per worker which should help push towards economic growth so when we're talking about economic growth the government can actually cause it they need to be targeting these three areas, but frankly, these three areas are the areas for where economic growth happens. If you see improvements in these, you should see economic growth. Additionally, you could say stuff like labor force, where it should be mentioned that like, if you have more people working out of your overall population, like as a percentage, so like say older people are working a little bit longer, while ethically that isn't always what we want, from an economic growth standpoint, that would be helpful because it is improving the amount of total labor in your economy. So that could work too. There's a dark side to that of like, well, if older people working longer would work, wouldn't like lowering labor age stuff also do it? It's like, yeah, that's where it gets a little bit fuzzy. So these are where we target typically more. All right. Now, that is actually it for the economic growth PowerPoint. That's kind of it for economic growth. And this is, I think, uh, 5.3, 5.6, and 5.7. So it's almost half of Unit 5, which is why Unit 5 is so short, is that Unit 5, at least half of it, is something that I can cover in. That was 12 slides. So that's kind of something. It also builds off the previous units. So if you need to, not a bad idea to go back into the long run aggregate demand and aggregate supply notes and checking for the LRAS stuff and see. I wrote down some stuff that shifted it. The Christian mentioned we don't really ever move that line in drawings, which we don't. They don't ever have you really draw LRAS moving because then you have to move like everything and it gets really visually confusing on a graph. Um, but it can move. And when it is moving, the important thing to take away from today's lesson is when your LRAS curve is moving over to the right, that's economic growth. It can happen. And it's actually what you want to be happening because it means that you've got permanent changes in your output. It's not just a temporary blip on the radar thing. This is an actual full scale the economy is different now in a good way. It's gotten bigger and stronger and more powerful. Cool. That's actually it for today's lesson. Thank you guys for watching. The next videos I'll have are over unit six and Colin Ford hasn't posted their videos for that yet. Luckily I've covered that for years now and they didn't change anything with unit six. So those videos will be coming out shortly. 
Thank you guys for watching as always, and I wish you the absolute best. Good luck.